Welcome to Quarantine Check-In. My guest today is a pretty much a legend of the Detroit scene. Um, <laughs> he was the host of the open mic at the Long Gone Club Bart. Yeah. He is uh, one of the instructors at Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle. You've played with a plethora of who's who yeah. here in Michigan. And you run a really cool podcast called Joel Radio at yeah. joelradio.net. That's correct. Please welcome Joel Fragamani to the show. Hello, Robert. Hello, everybody. How the hell are you doing during this? You know, we, I think we've all been better. I, you know, I, I actually, I, I'm thankful that we're doing this because I got a chance to put on a jacket for the first time in a while, you know? Yeah. In my hair. I, I saw that you actually got a haircut. After. I've had two quarantine haircuts as of uh, today, as of the recording, so. What is it like in the black market haircut? Area. Uh, you know, my girlfriend lives with me and she doesn't, so, you know. <laughs> That's nice. That's she nice. doesn't know what she's doing, don't get me wrong, but she, she did the best she could. So she is not a licensed stylist here in the state. Oh, no, she's very far from that. Okay, well, at least you're getting <laughs> I was, uh, I had a beard up until last week and. I also had a, do you remember how long my, I'm, I can't remember the last time I saw you. My um, beard was probably like down to there. It was like eight, nine months. Of not shaving. Yeah. I look like I was a miner who just came out of the mines after six months. <laughs> it was horrible. But, but my thing was it was hard with the mask. I was really wearing a bandana more than a mask when I go out to do errands and stuff. And that hair just goes right up your nose. Yes, that was one of the reasons I had to shave. Yeah, so I said, I'm getting rid of it. So this is, I don't know, um, 10 days of growth, something like that. Wow. For me, 10 days of growth is just more beard <laughs> yeah i'm not i was not blessed uh in the facial i have all my most of my hair uh, i'm jealous of you for that but I, uh, my facial hair is not all that impressive mine just grows scraggly i am not a good beard person yeah i, yeah, I trim this what can i tell you um yeah so what i like best about having to wear a mask it's like everyone is doing bane cos cosplay right now Bang? Bane from Batman. Oh, Bane. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, you can't tell who the bad guys are, you know? I would have personally loved if Trump would start wearing a mask. Because that would really make him look like a villain, right? I don't know, man. He looks too dumb and dumpy to look like a villain. <laughs> yeah, but imagine him giving, like, those press conferences with a big mask on his face. It'd be great. Well, I think then no one would understand him, which might make <laughs> press conferences better. We might be better off. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I am I am now fearful that we truly are living in the darkest timeline. I, you never know. I mean, who knows where this is going? You know, I mean, will we ever go back to what it used to be? I don't know. I and, don't you know, know, that's true comedy. I know we're going to get there eventually in this talk. But, I mean, I'm not all that optimistic, to be honest with you. It depends on the day. like. We've been talking, like, among comics that we think house shows are going to be the first things that come back. Okay. And then smaller shows. Sure. But so, well, we're all worried about if the venues for, like, the bars or the comic mm -hmm. shops that we do our shows out of, if they're going to be coming back out of this. Well, I mean, I think the biggest thing is, is the economy of comedy and how you can – you know, obviously the shows where nobody's getting paid or it's very low budget, those should be the first to come back just for that reason. You know, even when they say, oh, you can reopen the Comedy Castle, Royal Oak Music Theater, or the Fox, are people going to want to pay money to go to that? Or are they going to say, oh, you got to run with half a house or a quarter of a house? Well, then how do you afford to pay the people that are coming there to perform? It's and the answer is you can't. And so that, I think, is the biggest holdup. Yeah. It's not so much, you know, they're saying, okay, you can get together. You, know, you can get together at a bar or an open mic and have, you know, 50 people. And that'll be, that should be okay. But, you know, how do you get 200, 400, 1,000 people together? I don't know when I see that happening again. When there's a vaccine. Okay. Well, when's that? Get to work on that, Robert. Come on. <laughs> you know, I, You're a I, smart guy. I, I do. I have my amateur lab set up. Yeah, why I not? Have, I have my two beakers where I go like this and this. Yeah, hey, you're as good as anyone at this point. 
if if I saw that, I would be the greatest scientist and comedian <laughs> in the world. Well, it's uh, it, we're certainly uh, some time off from that, and I think, um, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't think we're throwing a switch and everything's back to normal. I don't think that's going to happen. No, it's it's not. Mm. And like the first two weeks of that, that's where you know we still had that optimism. Yeah. Now it's like. I just want to see my friends again. Yeah, there's that, you know, and, and maybe in a couple of weeks we're back to that or in a week roughly in Michigan if they don't extend that. Uh, maybe we're back to that at least. I hope so. I hope so. The, the, the virtual open mics are kind of killing me. Oh, well, yeah, there's those. I mean, look, I've done this, and I did a YouTube video with Melissa Hager. She interviewed me briefly. And other than that, I'm not even into – telling jokes right now i mean i'm still doing my podcast but even that it's like i'm not really into that that much i mean i'm doing it to do it and i like talking to people so that that is fun but i wish there was something else to talk about well we're not really going to talk about the virus at all (laughs) well me and you yeah yeah but we're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about something like we are both movie fans yeah sure yeah and that's the thing i do on my podcast talk a lot about movies tv shows that kind of stuff sure what are you watching right now? Yeah, I'm watching everything. My, you know, my girlfriend is, is here with me. She is also laid off from her job. So we have as, long, as many hours as we want to sit and watch whatever the fuck we want. And, um, you know, we have to compromise because our, 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 our tastes are different a little bit. Right. Um, you know, I'm a little more adventurous, I think. And, and, uh, she does not do well with like science fiction. Um, but anyway, yeah. So what have I been watching? Uh, geez, what have I watched? Well, I'm going through all these 2020 movies that never really came out like or what? barely came out. I've seen some of those. Like Bloodshot? I haven't seen that one yet. I saw Call of the Wild. Mm, all right, that was the Robert Redford movie, right? No, that's um, Harrison Ford. How, how was it? And The Dog. It was better than I thought it was going to be. That was okay. Wow. I watched Birds of Prey, which I didn't like. Okay. I watched, uh, man, why am I blanking on some of these? I watched that movie Bad Education that was on HBO with Hugh Jackman. How was that? He embezzled, it's a true story about embezzling from a school. Oh, man. That was pretty cool. It was a crime story and... uh, that was pretty good. That was maybe the best movie I've watched. I watched a Korean movie the other night. Parasite? No, but it was the director of Parasite. Oh, which one? It was called Memories of Murder. Ooh. And it was a true story about a serial killer in Korea. Ooh. And it was one of his earlier movies, the second or third movie that he made. And because I really like Parasite, I thought that was fantastic. So I said, let's get some of his other movies and my girlfriend liked Parasite. She said, okay, and we fought over that one. <laughs> we watched it, and it was pretty good, but Parasite is his best work, let's say that. Parasite is in my queue on Hulu to watch. And You haven't seen it? No. Oh, you got to see it. It was my best movie of the year last year. I don't even know what my best movie was last year. Well, how many did I mean? Do you make an effort to see everything, or are you? I have that AMC Stubbs, so I okay, make... yeah, yeah, I have that too. Yeah, I get that in Oscar season, so I can go, you know, three times a week or whatever. Um, so, I really don't remember what. Like, I was really disappointed with most of the movies that came out last year. Yes, well, it was not a. I thought there were good movies, but not as many, and I think most of them came out at the end of the year, so I think a lot of people didn't see them. Yeah, I saw Star Wars: The Rise of Skywalker. Of course, saw that as big Star Wars fan. It was a terrible movie. You know, at this point, I was just happy to get a Star Wars. You know, at this point, it's like you know, when do you expect? uh, It it was too much to expect a great Star Wars movie. Well, it just felt the whole the whole the whole final trilogy was so inconsistent. Yeah, it was it was not great. They could have done that many ways, all better. Um, but it is what it is. I'm glad that they're kind of done, at least for now, with the Darth Vader Skywalker lineage. 
Yeah, we'll see. I think you can let that lay. We'll see until someone else has a story. Well, you know, I mean, I thought, like, Rogue One was really good. My, my problem with Rogue One is I knew how all those characters were going to end up. Because okay. they said it in one line in New Hope. Yeah. I like Solo. I thought, I like, I thought Solo was all right. I, didn't, I haven't seen it again. I saw it at the theater, thought it was pretty good. You know, it was, it was entertaining. It was fine. And The Mandalorian was pretty good, right? Just check I that out. I haven't watched that yet. Oh, you got to watch that, dude. I, I've, uh, I've, been, I've been stupidly with my Disney Plus subscription just watching old episodes of Boy Meets World. No, watch, <laughs> watch The Mandalorian. If you are a Star Wars fan, it is very good. I will, but I got to okay. figure out how dumb Eric is going to get before the series is over. Oh, it, it's, you, you'll enjoy it, trust me. All right, I will watch it. I will. Um, they put some good people behind that. It was nice. Well, John Favreau was one of the creators of it. John Favreau, Taika Waititi, directed at least the finale, if not some of the other ones. And I think he's awesome. He's one of my favorite directors right now. Oh, he's, um, he's uh, did you see Jojo Rabbit? That was a good I movie. Love, I love Jojo Rabbit. Jojo Rabbit was fantastic. There's a great, here's a great quarantine movie. It came out last year. It was one of, I think it was my number two or three movie last year, but The Lighthouse. I have not seen that yet. With William Defoe and Robert Pattinson. It's on my, it's on my queue. Someone, let, let me, actually, let, gave me actually their Plex account. It's on there. Okay, yeah. And it's on, I think it's on Amazon Prime right now for, you yeah. know, for free, basically. But yeah, it's two guys in a lighthouse, I think in the 1890s. And it's black and white, and it's crazy. That's what I hear. I just need to be in the right frame of mind. And right well, now, uh, stormy night. That's my suggestion. <laughs> Find a stormy, gloomy night when you're right on the edge of losing your mind. Put on the <laughs> lighthouse. I, I don't know if I should watch it at with the state my mind is in at this time. Well, we're we're pretty much all there, so you're not alone. I've uh, I've been watching some weird double features like the other night I on Sunday night I watched Last Days of Disco and Ghost World. Last Days of Disco, I think I've seen. I don't know about Ghost World. I know what Ghost World is. I just don't think I ever saw it. It's good. Um, yeah. Yeah. Last Days of Disco was kind of boring. It's not as good as I remember it being. Yeah. I. Um, God, what else did I see? You know, I do this every week on the podcast, and I have a whole list. I'm just I'm old. <laughs> PRS can't remember shit that's what I got um but yeah there's so much I mean if you go through if you go to my podcast joelradio.net listen to my movie review show from uh you're basically the Oscar preview show I think it's from February this year myself Corey Hall uh Jason Filan Mares all sat down did our movie list of the year so there's like we reviewed like 50 movies on that I'm gonna tell you Jason has gotten really funny Jason knows what he's doing. Yeah, I love Jason. Yeah, Jason's great. Yeah, he sent me a video, like, at some point last year, and I'm like, all right, not ready yet. Then he, I saw him live, and he did this whole thing about praying to Satan. Yeah, like, yeah. One of the greatest jokes I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, he did the comedy class. I was very impressed with him. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I booked him for a show that unfortunately got canceled because of uh, yeah. the virus. <laughs> So much stuff is getting canceled, dude. It's unbelievable. But not pro wrestling. We sat through the worst WrestleMania ever. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know if I should talk about pro wrestling, man. It's just, uh Well, I'll tell you what. Here's what's happened to me personally. I had two front row seats for two different wrestling shows that got canceled. Because oh, of this. So, yeah. Uh, am I... Am I correct in thinking what they might have been well no i'll tell you what they were it was um evolve which runs in livonia at the knights of columbus which is like 500 seats it's a lot of you see a lot of the nxt guys on that yeah uh as well as you know indie guys that they bring in and those are awesome shows that venue's fantastic the guys work really hard they do long matches and stuff um you know you can do meet and greets with everybody so they're really fun shows um i've probably been to six or seven of those in that venue. And then um, Ring of Honor was touring. Uh, they announced their War of the Worlds tour with New Japan. And they had a show in Kalamazoo, which I think would have been like tomorrow or this weekend. Oh, wow. And I got front row seats for that. That sucks. And they had already announced some talent for that show. 
some of the Japanese talent that was coming in. So I was excited. And, I, I, hope, know, I hope Ring of Honor survives this. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where that all sits. What, what's, I mean, wrestling with no fans sucks. I mean, even to watch it. I mean, I watch AEW and I like it. But the WWE that I've watched, including WrestleMania, I, I fast forwarded through a lot of WrestleMania. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I watched it later and went like, I'm not watching some of this shit. But um, that stuff that I've seen from them just blows. I'm just yeah, not... AEW is actually making an effort to make it seem a little bit more lively than WWE is. Yeah, I think they're doing a good job. I mean, I'm I'm a fan of theirs. I went to their uh, their All Out show last fall in Chicago. Um, I had been to the All In show the year before that in Chicago that uh, they put together the Young Bucks and those guys. So um, I'm a big fan of theirs. I'd love for them to come back and and uh, see one of their shows. Certainly be high on my list of things to do. It was on my to-do list to go see. All <laughs> yeah, that Chicago show was great, and um, I thought the TV shows were very good. The pay per views are very good, and you know they've got one of those coming up in a couple weeks, which will be kind of an empty arena show. You know, you know, let's just give it away for free. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, they're, everybody's making the guys that have the TV contracts are running, and the guys that don't aren't. Yeah, and, and you know, I don't want to watch. You know, I love New Japan. And they've canceled everything. You know, they're canceled everything through June. Yeah, and it's like going back to like the movies, like Fast and Furious got pushed to... Yeah, right. And, and maybe to- with the movies, it's good to push these things back because it's hard to make movies right now because they're not allowing people to shoot. So, yeah. you know, if you think about the mo- next summer's movies would be shooting right now, but they're not shooting. So maybe you show this summer's movies next summer. Which is going to be interesting because we're going to have no content come the fall for a lot of TV series. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think a lot – didn't a lot of shows just kind of end? That, like I think Empire never shot its final episode because they just were like, yeah, we can't shoot the show and that's over. Um, Blacklist is doing so they're animating. The oh, really? Yeah. Okay, I never really saw Blacklist, but okay. I, I just read that yesterday, and okay, it's still on the air. I'm like, well, that's a I, that's one way to do it for sure, yeah. But it's it's going to be a weird world because look, we're this as you said that there's no off switch for it. People are still going to get sick in the summer. Yeah, and I, you know, people are going to get sick, and uh, I think there is going to be a thing where maybe I mean, my thought now is sort of like. Maybe it just becomes we're going to do this thing and whoever's putting it on is going to have a sign at the door that says you are assuming all risk by entering this venue. And, you know, if you want to come watch this comedy show and you get sick, that's not our fault, you know, and the performers can do it or not do it. And and the audience can come or not come. And I think that might be where we end up. That's actually a very interesting thought about it. You know, it's, it's almost, I hate to say it, but it, it, it's almost like the lawyers are going to fix this before the doctors. Well, think about it. I mean, it, it's kind of interesting because, you know, we do take that risk every time we leave the house. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, the governor and, and, and the president or whoever can say, oh, you got to stay home, you got to stay home, you can't go out. You, but, you know, there's a point when you just can't do that. Well, we're all... We're already seeing tempers flare. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm a guy that's, I'm fine staying home. I'm fine with that for now. But yeah, there's going to be a point when it's going to be like, all right, let's, I'll take the chance of going out, you know, and hey, you're over 65 or you've got uh, some health condition that would put you at risk and then don't go out. I, I mean, I hate to say that. That's not my solution for it. But it seems like that would be some sort of compromise thing. Um, and for the workers, you could say, hey, you know, you come in if you don't. If not, you know, you know, I don't know where that all comes down with unemployment. That's a whole can of worms, you know. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, as we know through history, as soon as it gets hot outside, mm-hmm. that's when tempers get even more volatile. 
Sure, yeah. So, I mean, people are going to want to work. People are going to want to mingle. Sure. And, I mean, as we saw in Detroit in the late 60s, there were riots. Well, they had to shut down Belle Isle over the weekend. Oh, really? I didn't hear about that. It was too full. Huh. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was, it was, it was like 80 degrees. It was it. beautiful. It was in the 70s this weekend. And, and yeah, so, I mean, it's – we don't – I mean, here's the thing, and I said this on my last podcast, JoelRadio.net. I will plug my shit while I'm on here, Rob. Fine. Everybody's guessing. That was my thesis. Everybody said, oh, well, at this point, we'll have this many deaths and this many in the hospital, and we'll be on the way down. And it's, it's all a guess. You know, it's all a guess. And people that say they're the, – the people that will tell you that they're not guessing, the people that will tell you that they know for sure are the ones that are the most full of shit. That's why I don't say anything because I know nothing. Yeah, I mean, I'm, saying, I'm not saying anything either, but I'm saying, you know, look, I'm saying is from day to day, we've got to make the decision about, you know, what we're going to do, what risk is worth it. And, you know, yeah, let's, let's wait another month and see where the numbers are, the numbers down, you know. Do the numbers of cases just go up because we start testing more people, you know. Um, well, that's what Trump basically admitted yesterday. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's completely true, isn't it, though? The more he tests, the more positives you're going to get. So, well, I've got to be honest, I don't want that test. Nick Pizzuti was telling me how painful it was sticking like that stick a thing up your nose. Yeah. Well, and I'm like, ugh. I, I, I had a septoplasty deviated septum reconstruction last year. Ouch. Yeah, it sucked. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. You told me you got beat up. <laughs> I probably did tell people that, but no, that's what I had. I talked about it. It was on the podcast. But no, we were, I was in class at that point. <laughs> yes. Um, so yes. did you have a class that kind of just ended midway through? Yeah, I had a class that we got about three sessions into it, and then it went bye-bye. Uh, is it going to resume once? Yeah, I mean, the plan is um, – in, in, you know, there's no date because it's really dependent on the club. But when I was talking to them, um, the idea is that I would start a new session, meaning like from the beginning. Right. Um, and then if you were in the class that got interrupted, you can take that class for free because you already paid for it. And then if you were a student that wanted to start, you could start the class. And if you had seen a couple of the lectures and decided not to see those, you could stay home. Basically, we're just doing a do-over. That's smart. I, I, I think that's the best way to do it, you know. Especially with this big gap. If it had been a few weeks, you know, it'd be one thing. But, I mean, I'm not – I mean, I, I don't I, – this is not based on anything. But if I had to guess for a real comedy club, like, like a comedy castle or one-night stands or something, I mean, Labor Day. Would that be my guess. And part of that is that if you know comedy, it's like summer, you don't do good business anyway. Right. Because everybody's outside. So, you know, that's that's my feeling anyway. That makes sense. I mean, Christine, you know, I can't pronounce her last name, Vito Vid Jeski. Yeah. They, she doesn't think any shows will be running until September. Yeah, I mean, it, to me, it makes the most sense just knowing how the business is in Michigan at that, you know, in July, August, June, you know, those shows don't really draw well. Um, you know, at Comedy Castle, we're booking uh, local talent, you know, um, we're not booking, you know, big names to come in at that point, generally speaking. But starting in September, that's when we'll have our Kathy Madigan, John Heffron, uh, Dave Attell type guys coming in and you know we're selling out for those shows at least you know in the past um, so I to me I don't you know that would be my best guess is is that's when that would come back but it's good said I'm guessing everybody's guessing I don't know anything well we'll know more in July yeah I mean that's the best you can do is just yeah you you do what you can do in the meantime but you know I've talked to a lot of comedians about you know um, you know, what are you doing for money? Are you getting unemployment? And I'm hearing all kinds of different stories. So um, even though I'm a comic, I, because I'm an employee of uh, the comedy cast, like really, because I work in the showroom, um, 
and I, I get a, you know, a W2 at the end of the year from them, you know, I was able to get unemployment. But, you know, if you're a comedian that's a self-employed independent contractor, you know, it's tough right now. Let's kind of talk about all the new comics. Do you see people leaving once we're able to come back? You see we're going to, like, an erosion of talent? Leaving the business of comedy or leaving at, at my state? level? It's not at my level. It's not really a business yet. It's still okay, but I mean, it's still a business. I mean, that's open mics are part of the business, even if they're not a paying part. They're still part of it. It's true. They are the kind of the farm system of it. Um, we call it um, you have comedy. I, you know, I think I, I think there's certainly people that won't come back to it, and I think part of that is because people will get jobs that won't afford them the time to do it um i think what's i don't want to say scarier but i think there's probably a lot of people sitting around going eh, when i come i'm gonna try comedy when i get but when we're done with this i uh there's a I, lot of people with a lot of time on their hands right now robert i've had i've met a few of those people on some virtual open mics yeah. and not to mention like virtual open mics the thing that you're doing whatever I mean, these, these things started right away. You know, they had a lockdown. We had a fucking pandemic, and there were 50,000 of these shows every night. And there still are, and that was two months ago. There's so more now. You think, yeah, that's what I mean. So do you think that people aren't going to want to, like, oh, here's a stage and a mic. Do you think people are not going to want to go to that when this is all over? Are you kidding me? I I, actually, I think there could be an explosion of really, really shitty comedians. I think open mics are going to have to change because of this. In what way? Um, well, bars are not going to allow, only allow a certain amount of people in there. Okay, they're, they're fair enough. All right. I think the open mics are going to have to go to an hourly system where these seven comics are on, or... They do like Tom Swan does and just have 10 comics for the night and that's it. Well, I mean, you can always argue that some of these mics that just put up everybody are too long anyway. And, and you could argue that, you know, my argument was always that the mics that were too organized didn't do well because nobody cared about the lineup for the most part, which, you know, you could, you know, but that's all pre pandemic, you know, um, you know, you can limit the number of people that are going to do it, I guess. But then you're also, you know, I don't see any. I mean, who's really where? Where are we looking at? Like, you couldn't do an open mic at this point. I don't know, I'm thinking like New Way or Brett Solofino's room in in uh, Dearborn, where <laughs> they they could have a thing where they have to put a guy on the door and say, "There's only 25 people allowed in here," and you know. As you know, with any place that's doing comedy, that's not charging for it, or that's not what they normally do, half of those people aren't even watching it. Yep. And that's being, and that's a, you know, that's a very generous half. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, well. Three quarters, 80%, maybe not watching it, you know? Um, so, you know, I mean, at that point you go, oh, we're going to have 25 people in this bar and you know, five of them are going to be watching the show. It's not going to be watching the show. But again, I don't think that stops comedians. I think the psychology of a guy who's sitting at home now, who has all this, you know, great social distancing material and, you know, I've been, I've been social distancing because a woman wouldn't get near me since 1997. I heard that joke. That's, you're gonna, that's all you're going to hear. Get used to that shit. Because that's all you're going to hear. You're going to hear about masks and fuck, you know. Everybody had a mask to wear a mask. Yeah, now I'm good looking, you know. You hear all this dumb hack shit, and it's all going to come out. Yeah. And that's what the mic's going to be. And, you know, it, it actually sounds awful. <laughs> well, it, it, it does, and I, am, I myself am not looking forward to that. Yeah. When my shows run up, I do have a no uh, – jokes about quarantine rule I, you know yeah, you can say that but you know i mean part part of the you know sometimes good comedy is what's saying is saying what everybody's thinking 
as long as it's clever. I agree. And if everybody's thinking about the quarantine or how nice it is to be back or whatever, then those are the jokes you're going to hear. Um, you know, I talked to some people on the podcast, Derek Richards, I think in particular was saying, you know, he's like, you'll do five minutes on the quarantine and then you'll do your regular stuff, which makes sense. But then again, what makes sense for a professional comedian to an open micer? Two different may things. not. Yeah. Do you think comedy, like the, the material itself, is going to have to change? Do you see dark comedy maybe uh, not being so res- – people res- – so uh, not being so uh, accepted? Um, no, I don't think – I mean, look, 9-11 – lived through 9-11, and certainly there was a point when um, certain people came out of the woodwork. And I think even after Trump got elected that, you know – they had some intention uh, to be mean or to be uh, political in a way that wasn't mainstream. Um, think about Dennis Miller after 9-11. I would like that. I would, I would like that. Well, no, but I mean, if, when you, if, you, if you're old enough to remember Dennis Miller pre-9-11, very clever, very smart, uh, loved by the left, uh, alt-comic, that whole thing, and he started waving his flag pretty hard on September 11, 2001, and hasn't really stopped. And now he's like this conservative guy that, you know, a lot of people don't respect anymore. And um, so I think we'll see that, you know. I think we'll definitely see some guys, uh, we'll see their true colors come out and, and guys that really want to hit this hard and make a career out of it. Uh, you know, they're going to find that audience. Um, if they want it, um, you know, and then I think there's going to be jokes about, you know, all the old people dying and, you know, the boomer remover and virus and all that shit. And Ugh. people are probably going to groan at that and say, that's mean. My grandmother died. How dare you? You know, there's going to be outrage. There's always outrage. Yeah. I, I've had outrage at my set before. <laughs> yeah. There's outrage about everything. You can't, you know. I mean, there's probably, you know, there's comics that aren't skilled enough to pull that off, you know, and I, I say that in class, you probably know this, you know, I say just, you know, just because Dave Chappelle is saying this, or he's talking about this, um, or, or Bill Burr, you know, when people buy a ticket to see those guys, they know what they're getting. When they walk into a bar because it's open mic comedy, they may not want to hear that stuff. So you got to consider that. And so I think when comics are starting out, I think you got to figure out, you know, how to not offend those people, those edge case people who are going to be offended. And the people that are offended aren't in the right. Don't get me wrong. Those people are idiots. But those people that get offended are the ones that can complain to the manager, complain to the bar owner, complain to the guy who books the show. And the next thing you know, you're not booked, you're not working, you're not anything. That's true. That is true. And you're going to be a hero. Uh, a hero to the open micer sitting at home doing nothing. Which is something no comic wants to be. No, nobody wants to be that. So, you know, you gotta, it's, it's very tough. I think, I think this, if anything, makes, um, I think it makes good comedy harder, you know? I agree. And uh, it was, it's weird. Like right before all this happened, I started re rejiggering my set again. Yeah. I'm trying to become a nicer comic. Okay. I'm trying to develop my... That's good. My 10, 15 minutes of cleanish material. Sure. Well, they say now, and I don't know how this relates to comedy, but maybe there's something there where, you know, music now, what's hot is old stuff. Really? Comforting stuff, classic rock, stuff that you grew up with, stuff that is familiar to you. Uh, is is doing very well right now, and maybe in comedy, then you'll have people wanting uh, an audience for Jay Leno and Seinfeld and uh, some of these guys, Tim Allen. I uh, not, not the cutting edge guys. I was watching the new Seinfeld special. Okay, how's that? I did not like it. <laughs> I'm a huge Seinfeld fan, and early okay. fan, it's like. I, I've heard this all before. Oh, okay. 
Is it actually stuff he's done before? Or is it just it's new stuff. Same topic, yeah. It's just it's all the same, you know, rhythm. It's yeah. I'm like, I never thought I would see the day where I turning Seinfeld off 15 minutes into a set. Yeah, I, you know, comedy subjective. Guys certainly lose. Uh, you know, especially for a guy like him who's got like a billion dollars. You know, how do you how do you relate to your audience? You know, how, how do they relate to you? Um, I mean, I think it's cool that he's still doing it because a lot of guys, you know, they got a pile of money and they're just going to sit there on it and not do anything, and that's okay. Comedy's hard. No one needs to go out there and face rejection. But I don't think Seinfeld's bombing either. No, the audience was loving yeah, it. Yeah, I think, I think any people that go see Seinfeld know what they're getting, and I think they're happy just to see the guy that was on TV. Yeah, I mean, I still, I still love his show. I went back to Hulu and watched episodes of it. Okay. I was never a bit – you know, it's funny. I was a Seinfeld guy who liked Seinfeld stand-up before the show. Okay. Before the sitcom. I never heard of him before the sitcom. Yeah, I did. I was a big Seinfeld fan. Now, granted, I was probably, like, I think the first time I saw Seinfeld, I would have been in, like, elementary school or middle school. Um, so, I was, you know, I wasn't, I was a kid, basically. But when the sitcom came on, I remember going, like, yes, yeah, not for me. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you watch like the first few episodes, it was not a good show. Yeah. Okay. Maybe that was what I did too. But even, you know, people talk about it now and I just go, nah, you know, it's just not my thing. It's fine. I don't begrudge anybody who likes it. It's fine. Uh, it's just not my thing. But again, I, again, I sort of, as a kid thought Seinfeld was very clever with his jokes about the cereal aisle and all that shit. You know, I thought that was clever. Well, that's what he was kind of doing. Like one of the first bits he talks about pop tarts being invented. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. yeah. When I was 12, I, when I was 12, I dug all that. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, but not um, 12 anymore. <laughs> um, well, man, this has been awesome. Um, okay. Before we go, before yeah. we, I, uh, I've become a big fan of missed connections on Craigslist. Missed connections. Okay. I'm gonna read one to you if you can. Uh, I know what that is. You can crack if you can crack a joke off of one. That would be awesome. Crack a joke. Okay. I comment. Snide comments. Yeah. So this one is from somewhere in Florida. Florida. All right. Well. Saw you at Zaxby's before pandemic. Long <laughs> hair young lady. You are so cute. We spoke in the line at Zaxby's in, I can't pronounce the city name, before all this pandemic stuff. We had a long one minute stare at each other. I will never forget you. I am a tall white guy. You are long hair, a bit shorter than me, head on my shoulder. So beautiful, like a 21-year-old Meryl Streep. I have to see you. Please send me a message with your face so I know it's you. You still living in Angier? Horses and open spaces. Remember me? Somebody knows her. I know it. She is so awesome. Okay. Just want to know you are okay. The world is better with you in it. Wow. Um, that, that is a very strange man. I, do you know what Zaxby's is? Yeah, Zaxby's is a chicken. A it is a take, basically a takeout chicken place. Yeah, well, there's, there's seats in there. And they there's seats in there, but it's, nah, you probably get your Zaxby's to go most of the time. Yeah, yeah. I've had it in, I've had it in Atlanta. Wow, um, I mean, look, if, you, if I could find a girl that loves Zaxby's, I'd probably be in a better place myself. But um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. It's just fucking Florida, man. They're crazy people down there. What, what I want to know is the one-minute stare. Yeah, what was that about? Did he stare at her for a minute and the conversation was, leave me alone? <laughs> Did she actually put his head on her, her shoulder? I, I don't know. Maybe he did some measuring, like. Yeah, like she was up to she was up to there. Yeah, young Meryl Streep in a Zaxby's line. More specific, a twenty-one-year-old Meryl Streep. Okay, but how old is our lady? Twenty-one, or is it like? I don't know. <laughs> you're forty-five, and you look like a twenty-one-year-old Meryl Streep. Yeah. Shoulders so beautiful, like a twenty-one-year-old Meryl Streep. This is how stalking starts. I think that I think that guy. Uh, I think that guy misses Zaxby's. I think he's personified his chicken and biscuits into the face of some lady that was in there. I don't know. 
Yeah, I think the only thing people can really fall in love with is, Zach, is Zaxby's is the Zaxby's sauce. Is the, is the sauce good? I don't know if I had the sauce. It is good. It is good. I'm not a sauce guy. My guess is that 21-year-old lady had a minivan with five kids in the parking lot. It is Florida. It is Florida. On that note, Joel, thank you so much. For <laughs> thank you, Robert. <laughs> we have a great show tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Jason Gilleran. Oh, the doctor is, is in. And he'll be talking about his uh, ordeal with having COVID. Yes. He's the guy to talk to. Yes, because he is a dick doctor, which makes him an expert. Yes. He is that, and he... I don't know if he had it. I think his wife had it. We both had it. Yeah, that's crazy. So I'm glad yeah. they're okay, and um, we'll see them. I'm glad they're okay. They're good people. I like Jason and Robin. So. I will uh, but thank you, Robert, man. This is cool. Yeah, I will hopefully see you sooner than later. And I hope you will. And, you know, who knows? Who knows where and when? And hopefully before August, September, there will be at least one open mic at Ridley's. I, you know, we, you know, the, the, you know, Mark, here's what I can tell you about Mark Ridley is he really does want to open the club. He really does want to do shows, and he's trying. Um, beyond that, I, I couldn't tell you when oh, no. or in what format that's going to take. Um, when it does open, I'll be there. You know, that's my plan. You know, I'll wait for him. And I will uh, have that advanced comedy class again that you took and uh, uh, has helped a lot of people. So I'm looking and, forward and to I that. Say, I've talked to a lot of people before we record this, who are really excited oh. to see this because the majority of the Detroit comedy scene has walked through your class and you have made us all better. Oh, thank you, Robert. That means a lot, man. That's cool. Now, I mean, I'll say me specifically because sure. I came as off as a deadpan Stephen Wright wannabe when I was <laughs> Yeah. And I think I have grown considerably oh. based on your advice. Thank you. Well, that's a great compliment to me. And, uh, but, you know, comedy is tough. You know, I, I do the best I can. You know, people say, can you teach people to be funny? And I go, no. <laughs> no you can but I can teach you to be a better version of who you are. Or see yeah. something in our writing. Yeah, that sure. Yeah. We might have missed. Yeah. But thank you so much. Um, stay safe, and we'll see you, thank you soon. Thanks, Robert. You're welcome.